1905, there was a short story written called The Gift of the Magi. <laughs> They've made several uh, 30-minute television shows based on this. Even, even Mickey Mouse has a, a Disney show on this, but the one that I saw was produced in about 1975. <laughs> and in this Gift of the Magi, and you have to put yourself in 1905 culture, but there was a very, very poor <coughs> family that they loved each other very deeply, the husband and wife, and they, they didn't have enough money to buy each other Christmas presents. And the wife had the most beautiful hair, and it was just, just gorgeous, 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 gorgeous hair. And she was really wanting some uh, nicer combs and brushes and things to be able to take care of her hair. But apparently her hair was like movie star quality, okay? The husband, his nicest possession was a pocket watch. And back then, people carried pocket watches, just like we would carry a cell phone today. That was the equivalent of their cell phone. <laughs> and then they would have a, a chain of precious metal attached to that pocket watch, which would be what attached it to their pocket so they did not lose it. And I believe the story says he had inherited that pocket watch from his grandfather, and it was of value. Well, one day, the wife decided that she was going to go and sell, have her hair cut off, and sell her hair to a wig company so that she would have the money to buy him the chain for his pocket watch. And while that was happening, simultaneously, the husband was out selling his pocket watch so that he would have the money to buy her the hair accessories, the combs, the brushes. And so when they came home that night, they presented each other their gifts, the brush and hair and accessories, or the brush and such for the hair that no longer existed, and the chain for the watch that no longer existed in their home. And it just showed how much they cared about each other and loved one another, and they desired to give their very best for each other. And as we are now full-fledged in Christmas, and just so you know, I, I don't know if you guys want to do any type of deal, uh, how long it's going to take me to kick one of these poinsettias off. I've already knocked one off earlier as this service today, but if I do, we'll just all have a good time with it. Um, but thank you, Brian. And then um, we, uh, we love to give gifts to those we love. I'll never forget, ever, uh, growing up very poor, and a couple things we, we did. My mom worked at a, a medical office clinic, and this was before a lot of modern technology existed, and so once a month, she would bring home all the bills, like to send out, like to bill all the, the, the monthly billing to the patients. And during that night, and it would take all night, all of us kids, it would help my mom, we would fold those bills, stuff those bills, and that would be an all-night process, and she made $75 extra a month to do that. That was how we helped. And then when, when I became a little older, my mom ended up working at a bank and was do, doing a little better, but she would work all week, 40 hours at the bank, and then Saturday and Sunday, she would work two doubles at Denny's and to make extra money so that she would have money to give for Christmas. And folks, Denny's is just not what I think of when I think of high quality establishments. I'm not saying they don't have good pancakes, but it's just, and my mom got treated very poorly there. And she would come home so exhausted, her feet would hurt. And you know, she, she would, sometimes was mistreated by customers and that type of thing. But she did that so that she would have something to put under the tree for the kids. And it just tell, shows us how much our, our, our love runs deep, gives us the desire to give. And the greatest example of this is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, 
the greatest example of love was God the Father giving us the very, very best he had, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. You can give without loving, but we cannot love without giving. And so I just wanted to point you toward the offering today with that and just settle it in our hearts that let the love of God be shed abroad in our heart to the point where it compels us to say, you know what? I want to give my very best, not just for my kids, not just for my spouse, but for the one who saved me. Amen? That's just our offering talk. So today, let's, we're going to pray one more time and get into the message. Lord, we thank you and praise you. I pray you put me on as your microphone today. Give me the right words to say with the right spirit to say them with. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would anoint our ears to hear the living word of God. Lord, that every person here would receive a touch from you. Amen. Two things I want to say. Uh, number one, sometimes, and today's sermon is not one of those times, but there are times as pastor, I have to wear the pastor hat, and, and, and you, I have to preach the Word of God or help people walk in the Word of God. And sometimes that... In a, when a culture is going kind of crazy against the things of God, that will put you pitted against the culture. Does that make sense to everybody? I don't ever want to come across as the bad guy in your life. I want to be the good guy in your life. Amen. I want to be on your team. I want to be rooting for you. I want to be your biggest cheerleader, your biggest supporter. I want to be a father figure. I want to be what, what, what I need to be to be the pastor. But if there ever is a time, and I want just that I have to preach the standard of the Word of God, and it gets on you like it, it directly confronts, confronts something in your life, I'm still your friend. I'm still, I'm still on your team. I'm still for you. But there are times I've got to preach it. And today is not one, not one of be one of those really convicting messages. Today is just a, a fun message. But I just felt like I needed to say that today. Amen. Does that make sense to you? All right. Well, praise God. Let's get into the Word. And in today's message, we're going to set up a series called Come Together for Christmas. Today's message, I'm going to give you the theological foundation. Okay, I'm going to give you the theological foundation. In other words, the scriptures to, to lay the foundation for this message. And then the next two to three weeks, I'm going to come back and we're going to show you the practical application of what this means. How to apply this because because i think theology is wonderful and if you're if you're a theology nerd like me you love studying the bible and oh what's this greek word mean and what does this point mean in jewish culture but at the end of the day i need to preach stuff that you can say hey i can use that today where i live at my house and so today is going to be a little more theology but over the next few weeks i'll be bringing the practical applications make sense here we go christmas is here Poinsettias on the church platform. In the past, crowded mall parking lots. Some of you young people will not know the, the preciousness of a parking space. You do not know what it was like to try to go to the mall on a Saturday, the month of December, and it took you an hour of getting through traffic just to be able to turn into the mall parking lot, and then another hour to find a parking lot space. And, and did you ever remember sometimes there would be some person that was getting into their car to get ready to walk out of the mall and someone would, would put their car position with the turn signal on and wait there for 10 minutes while that person was getting ready to back out and all the other cars and people were standing each other down like, I had my turn signal on first. Don't you dare cut in front of me in this parking space. And there, there were parking lot wars. Welcome to Christmas. Lights, tinsel, manger scenes, gifts, cookies, holiday festivities. And one of my favorite things on Christmas Day is I like to take a drive, and I like to see all the businesses closed. I like, I like to see every restaurant closed, gas stations closed. I, not, not that I want to see it permanently, but I love to see the world come to a standstill. 
And the reason it does is it started off as the mass of Christ, the celebration of Christ, a Jew born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. If there's any question on whose land it is, as the whole world stops to celebrate. Now, the idea, I think even some of the bigger retail stores are, are shutting down now. I, I think Walmart's giving all their self-checkout people the day off. I think, I think, I think it, it's, some of you are getting that. But the idea, one of the ideas of the mass of Christ is we come together. And you have family traditions. And, and you know what? Those traditions are good. I mean, it's, it, you should have family traditions. Whatever kind of cookies you bake, whatever you eat on Christmas Eve dinner or Christmas morning breakfast, those are special things. And we, 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 don't, we don't get mad about that. We celebrate that. <laughs> the idea, though, is we're doing things to help us to come together as a family and to take time to appreciate one another, be in relationship with one another, celebrate one another, connect with one another. It's about coming together for Christmas. And those of you that you got mamas, you got grandmas, you know mama and grandma, they want you coming home. Did you all hear about the, the father that phoned his children a couple days before Thanksgiving? And he phoned his son down in Texas. They lived in New York. They phoned his son down in Texas. He said, son, after 38 years, your mom and I are calling it quits. We're going to get a divorce. And the son was like, dad, you can't do that. You guys have been married 38 years. You're mom and dad. Don't you do anything. I'm coming up there right now to straighten this out. He called his daughter, who lived in California. He said, daughter, after 38 years, your, your mom and I are calling it quits. We're going to get a divorce. The daughter says, dad, you're crazy. Stop talking. You know what? Don't do anything. I'm flying out there right now. The dad hangs up the phone. He says to his wife, honey, I got the kids to come home for Thanksgiving, and they're paying their own ticket. <laughs> but mamas, mamas, and grandmas and dads and grandpas, they want everybody to come together for the holidays. Why? Because it's special. It's special. And on Christmas, we do celebrate the Mass, the, the celebration of the birth of Jesus, and that's what it's about. And I know we have all the festivities, whether you put up tree or tinsel, however you decorate your tree, whatever you eat, whatever. It's, it's wonderful, but celebrate Christ in there. But the Father of all fathers, God the Father, you see, we take after His nature. We were created in His image and His likeness. And God the Father of all fathers loves it when His people come together. He loves togetherness. He wants the family together. And that's what this series is about, coming together for Christmas, the blessing of unity, what it means to be in unity, and what happens when God's people end up out of unity with God or with each other. Our key scripture today is Psalms 133. Psalms 133, and you might want to turn there, open up your phone Bible, whatever you've got, your iPad Bible. <laughs> and please keep in mind, and I share this from time to time, oh, be a fact checker, okay? Don't just take stuff verbatim. I think it's important. If I say turn to your Bible, I mean, open up your Bible. See, well, make sure that the Scripture is lining up. Amen. Because we don't, we don't want to be preaching on the second Matthew or third Matthew. Okay? Let's be preaching out of the Word of God. And you want to get to know. The, the Bible calls itself the sword of the Spirit. Okay? And, and, and it likens Christianity under, unto a battle. And if you want to be in a, a battle... You need to know how to use your weapons, okay? Now, Psalms 133, verse 1, three verses. Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like 
the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard. The beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And as we come together for Christmas in your family or in the house of God, I want to do so with this psalm in mind. Now some of that is wrapped up in Jewish culture, and we're going to unwrap that for you and help you to understand what all that means. Unity there, the Hebrew word yakad, it means to become one. A group of people laying aside personal ambitions to pursue a common cause, interest, or action becoming like-minded. I wanted to show a video at this point to spice it up, give you a little kind of fun flair. So I, I just thought, what could I do? And so I, I thought, well, I've never really watched Jerry Springer, but let's see what Jerry Springer... So, so I looked up Jerry Springer and said, well, we can't show that in church. So I looked up a couple movie scenes and said, well, I wonder if we could show these. Nope, can't show those in church. So I said, I, I just wonder. I just wonder what would happen if I typed in YouTube, church fights. I can't show that in church. <laughs> but there's a lot of them. There's a lot of videos showing people duking it out, fisting it out, suing each other in the body of Christ. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. But it, it's there. It's there. And it was just, I about wanted to vomit. I felt like I need to go take a shot. I said, I'm not showing that. So bottom line, there is no funny video today. Because <laughs> I couldn't find anything that would help without hurting. But in the age of video, in the age of modern television, Jerry Springer was kind of a downer as a reflection on humanity. That's, you know, if, if someone didn't live here on this planet, and they came to this planet, and they saw the Jerry Springer show, they'd have a pretty low image of humanity. Yeah. But the same can be true. When, when the brethren of Christ walk out of unity, it can be a poor reflection on the church. When your family, I don't know if you've ever had family feuds before, if you've ever had issues where you have family drama. But as a pastor, there are times I have to help families and, and, and pray with people who, who've had that. It's a, it's a terrible, terrible reflection, and it hurts people. That's not how God designed for us to live. Unity can be around a vision, like, for instance, a, a sports team. Our vision is to win the championship. For a company, our vision, most companies, the bottom line is they say our vision is to, they're not going to say this, but to make money. But they're going to have a set of principles and a, a guiding statement. You know, when I was in CarMax, ours was to provide excellent customer service. We had four key words. We had service, selection, uh, quality and price. Uh, and those were the four buzzwords we keyed in on. That was, that was our purpose and our vision. That's what united us as a company, and that helped the bottom line. As a Christian, the cause of Jesus Christ should be what unites us with any other Christ-fearing person on this planet, what, no matter what color they are, no matter what language they speak, no matter where they live, what economic level, what all those things, the, the cause of Christ should bring us together to be one body. Sometimes I hear about Lone Ranger Christians. Do, some of you may know who the Lone Ranger is. Some of you may know what the William Tell Overture is. If you don't, the Lone Ranger was a, it's an old Western show, and he was the good guy. He was called the Lone Ranger. He, he wore a mask. Nobody saw his identity. And he, he was the hero of every episode. But you know, even the Lone Ranger had a friend named Tonto. Even the Lone Ranger had a partner. You know, God does not want us to be alone. I mean, Batman had Robin, right? Uh, Shaggy had Scooby. And the list goes on. 
But we need one another. Lions go after animals separated from the herd. The book of James tells us, Does any one of you sick call for the elders of the church? The Bible notes the prayer of agreement that if any two on earth agree is touching any one thing, it has a special uh, 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 power. Jesus himself, the king of all kings, while he was on this earth, he drew unto himself Peter, James, and John. Paul had Timothy. Moses had Aaron and Hur. Elijah had Elisha. We need each other. God's not called anybody to be a lone ranger Christian. So unity, and we're going we're to pick apart that, those scriptures for just a few moments here. What is unity? What how do we get there? Well, let's talk about what it does. The Bible tells us in verse 1, Psalm 133, how good, it's the brother and talking to us, how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. Number one, unity, when God's people walk together, brings us to a place that is good and pleasant. Now compare that in the scripture to James 3.16. James 3.16 is talking about disunity. It says where envy and strife exist, there is confusion and every evil thing. That strife is the number one, one of the number one enemies of your life. If you start, hear me, husbands and wives, if you start feeling strife balling up in your marriage, if you find yourself fighting m- more than you should be. That is a spirit of strife trying to get its way in your marriage. When that strife gets in, the Bible says confusion and every evil work. It's op- strife opens the door to chaos in your life. Do not allow strife in your home. Okay? And, and, and husbands and wives, I love you. I love you. I mean this. Your marriage, if you've been married for more than six months, your marriage needs to be at an eight, nine, or ten on a scale of one to ten. Do not be content with a seven. Do not be content with a six. Do not be content with any of those lower numbers. God's will is your marriage to be a high functioning, high quality marriage. The devil comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. The devil is a divider. The devil did not show up in the garden until there was Adam and Eve, until there was something to divide, and he divided and conquered. Okay, the devil is a divider. God is a multiplier. Parents, (laughs) you, you may go through times with your children, and they're going to go through several phases in life. And one of the hardest phases, parents, is when you go from being cool to your kids to being the unnecessary item in their life. And, and, and you know, when, and when they begin to hide themselves behind the room and close the door, and they see time with you as a punishment, not a blessing. But th- there, are, there are phases in life that they go through. But regardless of the phase, do not allow strife, division between you and your child. Get to the bottom of it. You don't want that in your house. I love you so much. You don't want drama. I, don't, I cannot tell you what you should do. But most families have somebody who is known to be the troublemaker in the family. And maybe they come to family dinner and they show up drunk, they show up high, or they show up with with things that that are not uh, conducive. I can't tell you what you should or should not do, but I can tell you this, you ought to approach that very prayerfully and get the mind of Christ. When God's people are unified, it produces a peace and joy. When God's people are in strife, it causes hurt, offense, and could even turn people away from serving God. You know, I I didn't, was not my intention as I was looking up those videos to see church drama. But there were a couple 
that got so bad that that it made the news. And the news was reporting live from a church that was having a, a board meeting where everybody was hating each other and they were cursing at each other. And, 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 and I'm thinking, if, if John Q. Sinner sees this and doesn't realize this is not the heart of Jesus, they may say, I don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. When we get out of love for one another. You know, another one I saw, I couldn't believe. There, there was a, they were doing a special, and there was, a, there was one microphone, two ladies sharing a microphone, and the, the, the choir singing. And then somebody comes out of the choir and gets up in that microphone. Now there's three, and those three are pushing each other back and forth to be able to get microphone time. Help us, Jesus. <laughs> Help us, Jesus. We want the good and pleasant. You know what? You all know what kind of the definition of the the word masochist is? Someone who enjoys torture. God has not called you to be a masochist. Okay? God has not called you to enjoy bad and unpleasant. There is the nature of the Father in you that says, hey, I want to have a life that's good and pleasant. Is there anybody here that says, Pastor, I do not want to have a good and pleasant life? I I mean, you'd be crazy, right? That would be a mental disorder to say, I want to have a bad life. I want to have an unpleasant life. We strive for the good and the pleasant. Well, the Bible's laying it out here. When brethren dwell together in unity, that's where the good and the pleasant are. When you come to church, we want you to walk in. We want you to feel the good and the pleasant. You know, I, I, we pray here all the time, and, you know, we have people come in, and, and we pray over the chair. We're praying for you. But one of the things I've been doing, I pray in the foyer, in the cafe, and over the doors, and, 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 and in the little area, the, the, the double door area. And, and my prayer is when you walk into this building, that the presence of Jesus overwhelms you. When you walk into this building, you become aware of his love. You become aware of his plan. You become aware of his, his passion for you. Why? Well, that's, what is that part? Of? I want you to feel the good and the pleasant. There's an old saying, the week is better when you go to church. Why? Because you came in and you took a dose of good and pleasant. You know, a lot of people take vitamins. Nothing wrong with taking vitamins. So, does anybody old? I, I, I missed this one. Thank God this is older than me. But there's a generation before me that you guys took castor oil. Does anybody ever have to take that stuff? Oh, my goodness. Great. I, you know, I'm so thankful. My mom and my grandparents did a lot of crazy things to me. That is not one of them. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. I am so thankful. Uh, there are people that think that eating onions is good for their health. They eat onions on a regular basis just for health benefits. There are people that drink ginger tea because of ginger tea health benefits. There are people that believe in vitamin C because of vitamin C health benefits. Well, oh, praise God. If, if, that, if God spoke to you, do it. do it. Praise God. But the reason why people take vitamin C, the reason why their entire store is set up for vitamins, there's entire YouTube channels and people have social media followings with home remedies and cures is because people want good and pleasant. Number two, it says that when God's people dwell together in unity, it's like the oil that flows down over Aaron through his beard and all the way down his garments. Oil in Scripture is a representation of the Holy Spirit. And in this case, it's a representation of what we call the anointing. Okay, the anointing means the yoke-destroying, burden-removing power of God. Now, up here at this pulpit, we keep this little jar of oil. This is oil, okay? This isn't like, you know, Pastor Matt sipping behind, you know, it's just anointing oil, okay? It smells very good. All right, and we, we believe uh, James chapter 5 and other scriptures tell us that when someone's sick, we lay our hands on them, we anoint them with oil, 
and the prayer of faith saves the sick. But the way we do oil is we do a little dabble, do you? Okay, and, and just to kind of show you how we do it, I would put my hand over the top. I we a little bit of oil. We don't dump. We, it's just nice and clean. We don't mess up the carpet, that type of thing. Now, in the Bible times, the way they did the anointing of oil, they would have a giant flask. Okay, and when they anointed you with oil, you would basically kneel down, and they would dump the whole thing of oil all over you. You knew you got anointed. There was no question. Did I get anointed today? Did I get anything? Oh, yeah, you, you got something. Well, the oil was a sign of the anointing of the power of God to break and destroy yokes off of your life and to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. When God's people come into unity, it produces an atmosphere, not just a little bit, but it produces an atmosphere of anointing, of Holy Spirit, tangible power that breaks yokes and burdens, that draws people to salvation, that brings deliverance, that brings the miraculous. Jericho. The Israelites were coming off of 40 years of walking through the wilderness, previously 400 years in slavery. And for 40 years, Moses had worked on these people to train them to stop thinking like a conquered people and start thinking like people who rule and reign. And they come, and Moses dies. The command is handed over to Joshua. And, and Joshua's first big assignment as the new leader. I, 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 think about this. this. This is assignment number one. We're going to find out if he's got it or not. We're going to find out if he can sink or swim. Joshua, your first assignment, get these, I want you to cross the Jordan River, which even Moses wasn't able to do. So you're going to do something that's not been done in 40 years, although they wanted to. And then you're going to come to a place called Jericho. Now in Jericho, we know that it's a, it's a walled city. It's fortified. They have modern weapons. They have great soldiers. They have a great army. You're going to take on this walled city, and here's how you're going to do it. For six days, you're going to have all the people make one lap around the city, and they're not going to say a single word. Now, think about the preposterousness of that. I love you, and I know you love me. I think you do sometimes. Sometimes I question it. But if today I said, you know what, folks? Let's go down to the state house in Indiana, whatever, or we're going to go to whatever thing, and we're all just going to, for six days straight, we're going to march around it one time, and you're not allowed to talk. Nobody's allowed to say a word. <coughs> I know you love me, but you might be saying, oh, pastor, I got that thing I got to do. I, I got a dental appointment. I didn't have one scheduled, but I think I'm going to go have all my teeth removed just so I don't have to go. <laughs> I, I think sometimes we, we don't, we, when we're reading it through in our devotions, we don't realize the audacity of this. I'm going to take you to a city that's walled, that's got a fortified army, that their, their soldiers are trained soldiers. They could kill us, and we're going to walk around. And it wasn't just the men, it's the women and children, too. We're walking around, and by the way, nobody's allowed to talk. No talking. But can you imagine? No talking for a whole day? Wow. I'm, I'm watching some of y'all in here. You can't go 30, 30 seconds, to, you know, <laughs> lean over and say, I don't, I don't know if this is ever going to end. What are we having for lunch today, honey? Did I turn the oven off? <laughs> and then on day seven, they were to march around it seven times. And then, there, then the way they were going to win the battle is shout. Now, if I told you guys, we're going to go to a fortified army base. They've got all sorts of weapons and trained soldiers. And all we're going to do is walk around them for six days. On the seventh day, we're going to walk around them seven times. Don't anybody talk. 
And then all of a sudden, at the end of it, we're all going to shout. That's going to give us a city. How many of y'all know that would take great faith? But the people did it. Joshua had to be some amazing leader. I mean, to have that kind of loyalty, that kind of following. But, but one of the keys was, he said, I love this, he said, no talking. You know what? How many Christians have talked themselves out of a miracle? You know how many Christians have talked themselves out of a blessing of God? Because we begin to speak against the very things that God is calling us to do or has enabled us to do. And there are times God's put some amazing things in front of you. And be careful. Don't use your mouth to sabotage what God wants to do in your life or in your family or in the kingdom of God. Amen. That was the key. Guys, you're, we're going to do this, but you just keep your mouth shut. Don't talk against it. Can, can I just, can I help you? There, there, I, I I worked in corporate America for a while. I understand sometimes there are some things about corporate America that are just absolutely no fun. I get that. There, 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 there are things you have to, you know, there's, there's management, the management above management. There's policies. You've got some guy in corporate office looking at a spreadsheet who doesn't have no concept of what's actually going on and dictating things. I get that. But you know what? When, when change comes down, when you get those corporate memos, when you get those emails, you know, the natural human reaction is to say, well, this is stupid. I don't know why we're doing this. There's some idiot up at corporate, doesn't know what he's doing, blah, 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 blah. You know, don't, don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. You want to be worth money in your corporation? You want to move up in your corporation when everybody else is blah, 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 blah. You're the one who says, well, we're going we're gonna to find, find out what makes this. We're going we're gonna to do this. We can do this. You know, it is so easy not to be stupid. I mean, and, and people say, well, you're just a brown nose. Well, it's not about being a brown noser. It's about realizing there might be somebody above you who has a better perspective. And they're making more money than you. They're in a higher perspective than you for a reason. And if we'll learn, instead of criticizing everything that comes down, to say, you know what, maybe there's something to this. Maybe we'll be at the top someday looking down. Amen. We, we have to learn that, that, that you know what, I want, I want to be a unity person. Even at, at your work, don't be the complainer. Don't be the whiner. Don't be the one that's coming in late, leaving early. Talking bad about everybody. Talking on your cell phone all day. Man, we got plenty of those. You're, you're making a contract. With your time, you're contracting. I am giving you my time, and you're going to give me X amount of dollars. That is a contract. And Christian people, we ought to do our best to have integrity to give our very best. We are, I mean, I, I don't believe in calling off sick when you're not sick. A lot of people, well, I'm calling off well today. <laughs> but, uh, see, your word is powerful. You, and, and, and if... You see, we, we want to have integrity with God. How, how can we have integrity before God? How can we have integrity to fight spiritual battles if we don't have integrity that if we're selling our time to our employer for X amount of dollars per hour, if we're not giving them that time fully? So unity, and, and you'll find, and, and corporations know this, sports teams know this, Churches sometimes know this, but man, if, if we'll get people unified around a vision, we can do anything. Yeah. Acts chapter 2, they were in one place, one accord, God moved in great power. People come to church because they believe God can make a difference. You know, most, most people didn't come today because they don't believe in God. 
Most people didn't come today because they said, you know what, I don't have anything else better to do. I'm just going to go find something to do on a Sunday morning. I'm going to go to church. Most people came today because you're believing God to be involved in your life. You want to hear the Word of God to apply it practically in your life to make a difference in the bills, the kids, the families, the work, your destiny. Because you believe that God is all-powerful. And as we're coming, we want to have that power that comes with the anointing, and that flows on unity. Where there is confusion, where there is envy and strife, there is confusion in every evil work. But where there is unity, there is good and pleasant and power. And i got to start wrapping up. Number three, there's provision. I'll just, just say this. The, it says, it'll be like the dew on Mount Hermon. Now you, we read that in our devotions like, well, what's the big deal about that? But when you put this in Jewish culture, they knew Mount Hermon. And there was something in the weather and the way that Mount Hermon sat in relationship to the sea that on Mount Hermon, 365 days a year, no matter how dry it was outside, that mountain had moisture and dew on it 365 days a year. Perpetual water. Water in the Bible, many times a symbol of life. When God's people are in a place of unity, it's like the dew on Mount Hermon, that there is continual, perpetual substance of life. Wow. And you want your family to be blessed. Learn to communicate. If you're the type of family, that seriously, that... that, that Things escalate over a little thing. I, I hate to bring this up. And, I, and I, don't crucify me, please. But I think 80, 90% of you know what I'm talking about. But if you've ever watched the Christmas Vacation movie and Cousin Eddie and his wife, Catherine, there's a lot of families, that's where they live. And one little thing goes wrong and they're in tears. One little thing goes wrong and it's escalated. Right? You don't want to live there. If that's where you're living, it's time to learn to rise above that. It's time to learn you don't have to be right. You don't have to have the last word. Your unity, your agreement is so much more important than who makes better mashed potatoes or whether you should boil them for 10 minutes or 12 minutes. I mean, I've seen families fight over the silliest things. I've seen, I've seen families tear apart. One of your loved ones passes away and goes to heaven, and they, they leave behind some inheritance, or, and, 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 and the children and the grandkids begin to tear each other apart. It's not worth it. Yeah. Lastly, it says uh, in Psalm 133, where God's people dwell together in unity, it's where God commands the blessing. Now, those little participles are kind of important, okay, because uh, there's a big difference between A and the. We can look at some of you today and say, you know, Mark Lewis is a basketball player. Pastor Matt is a basketball player. But if we put the word the in front of that, who is the basketball player? And there would be some argument. You know, some would say Michael Jordan is the basketball player. Larry Bird is the basketball player. LeBron James is the basketball player. But regardless, when you say the basketball player, that's a whole different level than a basketball player. Right? And what God says is where, where God's people dwell together in unity, I'm going to put not a blessing. I'm putting the blessing. And when we study this blessing, and I don't have time, I'll have to pick this up next week, I want to, I'll just bring out some of that blessing. That, that, that's where you want to be. That's where you want to be. I, I, if you had, if you're a fisherman, and you've got a pond on the left side and a pond on the right side, and the pond on the left side, people are pulling out five-pound bass one after another, and the pond on the left side, they're fishing, they're catching one two-inch bluegill every 20 minutes. Which pond are we going to fish in? We're fishing in the one loaded with bass. Why? We want the good stuff, man. 
Some of you farmers out there, and you're, you're looking for land. You're not looking for the land full of rocks and trees and hills and cliffs and, and terrible stuff. You're looking for that flat land. You're looking for that good quality Indiana soil. Why? Because you know it makes a difference. It's going to have yield. It's going to be profitable. It's going to be easier to work, easier to manage. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I want us to understand there's a difference. There's a difference in your family. There's a difference in the church. There's a difference where you work. There's a difference where you educate. There, there's a difference when we walk in unity and love and, and, and in fellowship with fellow man and we keep striping the vision out, you're going to find yourself not just walking in a blessing, you're going to find yourself walking in the blessing. I love you all very much. If you would like to get born again or you're one of the people that raised your hand today, we're going to have people down here to pray with you if you need prayer for any reason. They're going to be down here to pray for you. We'll be taking that offering next Sunday night. We'll be here Wednesday night preaching the gospel. Good news. I hope you're on your way to a Merry Christmas. Salt. We'll see you tomorrow at noon. $1,000 gift limit. <laughs> Bless these people, Lord, as they go. We thank you for helping us as we've started in this Christmas season. I pray for every family to function at the level of excellence and unity and love and faith. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you out in the foyer.